Hello, welcome to the first video reading guide for Physics 131. In this particular video, we're going to go through the first chapter of the OpenStax textbook. I'm going to go through, point out some key points that I think you should pay particular attention to, and maybe a add a few annotations as we go along. I want to start actually with the caption to the figure right at the beginning of chapter one. This is what I really love about physics. Physics is a small set of ideas that will fit on a coffee cup. I have one. And they can be used to explain what happens all the way from inside of a proton and neutron, the parts of a proton and neutron, to what happens to planets and stars and galaxies and even the universe as a whole and everything in between basically works under this same short list of fundamental principles that will fit on a coffee cup. I mean that's just absurdly powerful and the reason y'all are in this class is that this fundamental set of rules are the rules that everything else has to play by. So, chemistry, you can't have chemical reactions that don't conserve energy. And even life, evolution has produced life forms in a huge, huge variety of forms, but evolution is constrained by what it can do by the laws of physics. There's actually a limit on how big of a land animal you can make, and this is the laws of physics. Before its own weight, we'll just crush it. And so every other field has to play by the rules of physics. And that's one of the big reasons you're here. I know it's very tempting to skim through sort of these intro chapters, but in this particular case, I actually think it's worth going through them and, and doing a little thinking. I know that many people have this exact idea that physics involves memorizing a bunch of equations and solving problems that have no application to reality. I don't want you to think that at all. In fact, one of the big goals of this class is to, to get you to see physics as not a list of equations, but a list of ideas that we just so happen to express mathematically because it's a powerful and useful language. And I want to do problems that will actually connect to your everyday world so you can see that Physics does do what I say it does. It's the ground rules that everything else has to obey by. Along the way, we're going to develop some nice problem-solving skills that many other people want you to be, want you to gain by taking physics. So now let's move along a little bit. Moving on here to page six. You have a bit of an introduction of physics, which is you know, interesting. Then we have a bit of a discussion about what physics is and what's the domain of physics. Physics is really concerned with describing the interactions of matter, energy, space, and time, which sounds very grandiose, and it is. But these are the big fundamental building blocks that everything else has to work with. I mean, life is matter and energy interacting in, in space and time. So physics is concerned about what are these fundamental ideas and how do they interact on a very fundamental level. So moving on a little bit, you now have some applications of physics which you might find interesting but aren't particularly critical. It's not like I'm going to test you on them or anything. So moving on. We're moving on to models, theories, laws, and the role of expectation. Now, if you've taken science classes before, some of this might be particularly familiar. If not, that's okay. But one thing I want to point out is that since people tend to think of physics as being equations, they tend to miss the fact that the ideas of physics can also be expressed in words and sometimes words are a better way of expressing the ideas of physics. When you express the ideas of physics in words, however, you need to be careful that 
the words you're using have very precise definitions. Now, you might be familiar with this with the idea of theory, which has a different definition in our sort of colloquial everyday usage than it does in science. In science, a theory is, is a very well-developed hypothesis that has withstood this test of time and describes a lot of phenomena. Whereas, in everyday usage, a theory essentially means a guess. So we'll see that a lot in our study of physics, that the words we use in physics are often related to the everyday definitions, but often are, have more precise definitions than our everyday usage. A big idea in physics is the idea of a model. And a model is a representation of something that is difficult or impossible to display directly. Now we'll use models a lot in this class. For example, we may talk about the motion of a person walking along. Now if we're just interested in the person walking along and, and how they move, say, through a city, then the fact that they might be waving to people as they walk along or something like that is not particularly relevant and might be very complicated or difficult to understand. So we might make the simplification that a person becomes a dot. Now, this is something that a lot of people have actually quite a bit of trouble with at first. It's like, a person's not a dot. A person's got a heartbeat and blood moving through and they can move around and different pieces can move differently. And that's all true. But sometimes we don't care. And this is a big difference of physics. Every discipline approaches the world with their own unique perspective and their own unique approaches. And this diagram here really describes the approach of physics in a nutshell. In physics, we like to simplify what's going on to the simplest case first and understand that. Let's try to understand the simple thing because the world is a very complicated place. So let's understand a simplified version of the world. And then once we have a grasp of the simplified world, then and only then maybe we'll go back and start thinking about okay maybe it matters that this person is is waving or shaking their hands or or whatever maybe that's relevant sometimes it is sometimes it isn't but the reason we like to do the simple world first is that and this is kind of remarkable the laws that we discover in the simple world still apply to the complex world. The laws we're going to talk about in this class of blocks and springs and all of these things, the same laws apply to cell membranes. It's just a much more complicated problem. But the basic laws that are at play are the same. So moving on a little bit. the scientific method, which should be relatively familiar to you if you've taken some science courses. Then at the end of page 10, beginning of page 11, you kind of get into the evolution of natural philosophy and where physics comes from, which is interesting, but not overly relevant. One of the things I do want to point out here is the distinction of classical physics versus modern physics. So what is the distinction between So what is the distinction between classical physics and modern physics? Well, classical physics is when things are moving slowly, what's slowly? Eh, less than about 1% the speed of light, or are big. What's big? Hmm, bigger than, say, molecules. 
So as long as you're moving slower than 1% the speed of light, which is pretty slow because the speed of light is pretty big, or you're bigger than a molecule, classical physics will apply. So most of the things you're going to run into or interact with, the laws of classical physics are the ones that are going to apply, and those are what we're going to study in this particular class for the most part. We might have a few forays into modern physics, but for the most part, we're going to stick to classical physics. Now, historically, classical physics is all physics developed before 1905. What happens in 1905? Albert Einstein's theory of relativity comes out in 1905. And starting then, there's a huge transformation in the very fundamental ideas of space and time that makes the world much, much richer. It's not that classical physics is wrong, it's that it's an approximation to the truth. In classical physics, to use the analogy I just used, we're treating thing, people as points. But modern physics, such as Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, which is what kicks in when you get about molecule size or smaller, that's starting to add in the shaking hands and the blinking eyes of the people. So, again, it's not that classical physics is wrong per se, it's just that it's an approximation to the truth. But so is modern physics. We don't believe that modern physics is the end-all be-all. It's just a next approximation to reality. Takeaway, classical physics is what we're going to study in here and applies to a large array of scenarios. As long as you're moving slower in the speed of light, which is pretty much all the time, or you're bigger than a molecule, classical physics will apply. So here you have some listing on more limits on the laws of classical physics that do have relevance for your everyday life. A famous one is you have things like scanning tunneling microscopes, which if you're in a lab studying very small things, you'll deal with. These aren't classical. Or you probably have something that's non-classical in your pocket. GPS, that's also non-classical. So now, moving on a little bit, we're going to move on now to section 1.2, physical quantities in units, on, on page 13. This is probably going to be a review to most of you, um, but I want to make sure that you're familiar with the ideas. Most of you are probably familiar with the ideas of units, you're probably familiar with the fact that there are SI and English or British units. Um, in here, we're pretty much going to use only SI units, and we'll actually have some activities to help you become more familiar with what the SI units are. How much does a Newton of force feel like? To help you get a better grasp on what some of these things are. Here's your basic list of fundamental units, meters, kilograms, seconds, and amperes. We will not be using amperes in this part of the class, or amps as you might have heard them. That will come in 132 when you start talking about electric current. So in this class, everything's going to boil down to meters, kilograms, and seconds. But you also have derived units. So, before you get to derived units, you have some discussion on how the second is fundamentally defined. Interesting, but not super critical. Similarly, the meter, not super critical. The kilogram. This is much more interesting because they're actively changing how this is going to be defined, but it's not super critical. There's a nice article on your reading guide about the effort to change the definition of the kilogram if you're interested, but it's not super critical information. So then we move on to the metric uh, system and 
orders of magnitude. So orders of magnitude is a term that we'll use a lot in this particular class. So what do we mean when we say order of magnitude? Order of magnitude basically means when you write something in scientific notation, what's the power of 10? So for 800, the order of magnitude is 10 to the 2. Similarly for 450, the order of magnitude is 10 to the 2. This is going back to that idea of estimation in Fermi problems that we'll talk a little bit about in class and there's some reading on later. This is just a term that I want you to be familiar with, the idea of an order of magnitude. Now you have your list of metric prefixes. Um, I'm expecting you to be familiar with all of these from nano to giga, so 10 to the 9 to 10 to the minus 9. I'm expecting you to be familiar with all of these and just know them. So when we put a question on an exam and it says micrometers, I'm expecting you to know that a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay? So I'm, I'm expecting you to know that. In addition, there's actually one more unit for length that I'd expect you to know, and that is the angstrom. It's an A with a little circle on top of it, and that's 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 10 meters. This is not a standard SI prefix, but it gets used a lot in, in chemistry and molecular biology. So I think you should know it. And it's a nice thing to remember because A for atom and angstroms are roughly the size of an atom. <clears throat> then you have known ranges of length, mass, and time. The big ones I'm expecting you to know are length. And there is a nice table of lengths I want you to know in the list of math we expect you to know document. So that's the one I, I really want you to know about. So go and have a look at that. So go have a look at that. Unit conversion and dimensional analysis here. Again, I'm going to assume that most of you are pretty familiar with this. If you're not, go have, you know, have a close read of this. And if you're still confused, please come and see me as soon as possible so we can get that sorted out. So on this page, page 18, you have another nice big old table of useful sizes of stuff. But like I said, this isn't what I expect you to know. What I expect you to know is the one that's on our list of math we expect you to know document. This is helpful perhaps, but I'm not expecting you to have this table memorized in any sort of way. So now moving on. Before we talk about section 1.3, now I want to return to the idea of derived units. So what's a derived unit? Well, a derived unit one good derived unit you might think of is miles per hour. This is a distance over a time, or if you want to be in the SI system, meters per second. One derived unit that I'm hoping that you will be familiar with is the derived unit of density. And what is density? Well, density comes up anytime we're talking about a fluid. And what's a fluid? Well, a fluid is anything that can flow. So what are we talking about? We're talking about liquids and gases. Those are things that can flow. Both liquids and gases are therefore termed fluids. And density is represented by the symbol rho, that's not a P, that's a rho, it's a Greek letter, 
has kind of an R sound. If you're a scientist, I recommend you develop a familiarity with your Greek alphabet. Comes in handy. And it's defined as the mass of fluid divided by the volume. So a good example of density is the density of water, which is the density of water, H2O, is one gram per cubic centimeter. One gram per cubic centimeter, which means that one cubic centimeter of water has a mass of one gram. That's the idea of density. If you want more information on density, you could actually jump into section 11.2, which talks about it in a little bit more detail, density being mass over volume. So that's a density. I'll just be able to expect you to calculate densities as a complex unit and do some simple interpretations. Nothing beyond that at this particular point. So now let's move on back to chapter one. We had pretty much finished up section 1.2, so now let's move on to section 1.3. Um, I want you to skip this section. Just, just, just don't read it at all. I'm not going to do significant figures at all in this class. In my years of research at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, we never once used significant figures. Um, there's a much more important and sophisticated and relevant for you to know way of handling uncertainties called standard deviations. And there's some readings about significant figures and whatnot in the reading guide, and we'll talk about standard deviations in class. So just don't read this section at all, just, just skip it. So skipping 1.3, moving on to section 1.4 on approximations. So we'll talk a little bit about approximations in class, and this might be a new idea for you. Um, what's an approximation? It means that we're doing very rough one digit and order of magnitude, there's that order of magnitude word I was just talking about, calculations to just get a rough feel for how big or how small or how fast or, or whatnot a quantity is. This has a lot of different uses. There's some nice uh, articles in the reading guide about the relevance of this particular skill to biologists and in research asking uh, life science instructors, one of the things they hope uh, students will get out of a physics class is learning how to do these types of approximations. The reason we teach them here is physics are very natural at this. We do it a lot, so it's a very natural place for us to teach this particular skill. So go through this. Like I said, we'll do some practice in class. Read through this. There's some more readings on the reading guide for you if you want a little bit more help on what's going on and, and what this is. But the basic idea is you're taking information you know, such as um, I happen to know that there are roughly 7 million people in the state of Massachusetts. You're taking information that you just know and putting it together to solve for things you don't know, to get a feel for what the answer might be before you do any calculations. So that's what this is. There's, like I said, some more readings on your reading guide, and we'll do some practice in class. I'm really only expecting you to be able to do some, some rather simple problems, such as how many times will you blink in a 24-hour period? Well, in order to do that, I can just sit and count how many times I happen to blink in 10 seconds, multiply that by so that gets me number of blinks per second. From there, I can calculate number of blinks per minute, number of blinks per hour. And then I go, okay, 
I'm not awake for 24 hours. I typically try to sleep like eight. Usually doesn't happen, but it's what I aim for. So if I aiming for that, that means I'm only awake for 16 hours. And you kind of put these numbers together to get the number of times you blink in a given day. Like I said, we'll do some more practice because this is, this is a sort of odd skill for people the first time they see it. But it, you'll see, I hope, that it's a really useful skill. So this pretty much concludes the reading guide for chapter one. Uh, I would recommend, you know, you use this guide to go through, do your reading, take notes on your reading, use those notes when you're trying to do the mastering physics homework, and also bring those notes to class so that you can use them uh, to solve the in-class problems and activities as well. So this concludes this video. Have good reading.